thanks for joining us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Soreo. I am joined by my co-host this week, Ms. Eileen Huff. You are the president and CEO of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. And you are getting so good at this, Eileen. I don't know what I would do without you, that's for sure. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you so much. Honored to be here with you today and um, just very excited. Um, our businesses, as we've been talking about, have shown such creativity, such innovation um, in terms of you know staying in touch with their customers, um, finding new ways to deliver products and services. Some of them are now, you know, we have some curbside pickup for limited segments. Um, so they've been built very resilient and they are trying to stay positive. And um, we just want to thank our local residents um, and our cities for continuing to support our businesses. So important. So important. Shop local, of course. And yeah. this week we have some exciting news. Our very own Rancho Palos Verde City Hall opened its doors and I had a chance to catch up with our city manager our Moranian and our mayor John Cruikshank and let's hear what they had to say and this week we actually did open City Hall um, we are still we have the plexiglass up now but please don't forget that there's humans behind those plexiglass they're here to greet you, help you. Um, we still want to continue to be safe uh, while we're at City Hall, but it's a significance because, you know, it shows that things are slowly starting to open up for our community. Anybody who wants to or is considering coming to City Hall, knowing that we were closed for almost two months, we wanted to make sure they understood what the protocols are. And so just in case someone didn't know that and they were just driving in, we um, what we did is we set up a sign right as the entry point that is right in the center of, of the, the two lanes there that you have to stop and read the sign, which gives instructions. And then when you get to the parking lot, we have another sign posted up, a banner. And then we've, we've set up, what's unique here is we set up a monitor. We have a five... 55 inch monitor that we put out um, near the front door to the community development department that essentially serves as sort of um, a kiosk to inform you what if if the public counter is occupied or if there's already being served if someone's being served there then you would we would ask you to wait um, call we'll add you to our wait list and then wait in the car or in the park grounds and we'll call and text you uh, to come in when 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 the lobby is free we're asking to call and and make an appointment. If if you don't, we uh, you could still walk up, but but we only are allowing one person at each of the three public counters because of of the size of the counter. So. Uh, if someone's being helped, you're going to be asked to wait in your car. Uh, but 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 if no one's here, we'll, we'll you can come in and we'll we'll sh lock the door behind you while we're helping you, so it prevents someone from walking in and and um, stepping into your space. Our city hall is unique. Um, we uh, this building, you know, was a former part of the the Nike military base, and so it, it's almost designed to, for, with individual offices. So in a lot of uh, in most cases, individuals have their own own offices and so there are some very there are actually very few common open space areas here at City Hall so you have to factor that in as we're looking at our reopening plan and saying okay um, prior to reopening most employees were, were teleworking and so now if we're gonna bring them back on board are they going to be in an office that where, the, where they can be contained and safe from others and and others safe from them some of the measures that we put into place as we were we were thinking out the reopening is we definitely wanted to have the physical distancing so we we made sure that for the behind the back the back of um, the offices that that people were in their their separate offices for physical distancing but we also want to factor that in for the front lobbies we have three lobbies here at city hall we have it in the community development department we have the main lobby over here and then we have um the public works lobby so we wanted to make sure okay looking at the space there we have capacity issues we wanted to mark off the ground where people can stand and be safe from others and and more than six feet away then then for the employees we wanted to make sure that when they're out in the public um, or common spaces that they're wearing a face covering. When they're interfacing with the public that they're wearing a face covering. Where the members of the public that come in are wearing face covering. We've also um, set up uh, sanitizing stations at every door entry point to the the building so that individuals who are coming in from the outside could wash, sterilize their hands before they come in and, and meet with our employees. 
Maria, I understand that our recent city council meeting was a little different this time. Yes, it was. Actually, mm -hmm. our city manager, Ara, and our mayor, John, sat down with me earlier this week, as you just saw, and they talked about this hybrid city council meeting where they mm -hmm. had a couple of people from the community there and a few more council members were actually in the chamber. So let's hear more about that. Since March 17, we, we've had um, virtual city council meetings. And so the thought was, okay, well, what can we do since some of the um, stay-at-home orders were loosened to bring some of the council members back and, and uh, reopen our, our city hall and city council chambers? So we, we tried out this May 19th meeting was our first ever hybrid city council meeting. We had three council members present and two were um, virtual using the Zoom platform. Um, in addition to the three council members, I was in attendance as the city manager and so was the city clerk. And then we had our behind the scenes and we had our cameraman and, and the operations there. So there were a total of uh, eight of us in the room. And so that allowed um, two members of the public to be in the room so so we weren't having more than 10 people gathering in a space but we have um has park has a uh, two uh, overflow rooms so we had the classroom and the fireside room so we set up uh, 10 chairs in each of those rooms to accommodate individuals that came in so we were back over at hess park at the community room and there were three of us we uh, took a seat in between each of us and so that we were a good distance apart um, we had the city manager there, the assistant city clerk was there. Uh, we had our IT person that put all this together with his team. We had a couple of your media staff there. And uh, we had two people in the audience there. But it was just great being back in the uh, uh, cha council chamber and, and knowing that that's one step closer to getting the community back together. Well, the way that we do real estate could look a little different because of the pandemic, but our next guest is going to talk about that. Tony Self, thank you so much for being with us today. And, uh, you know, t tell us how your business has changed over the last month or so. Uh, it's changed quite, quite a bit. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, event here. Um, so in real estate in general, just because we enter into people's homes, mm -hmm. um, we've had a tremendous amount of change of how we actually go and show real estate. Uh, we were Initially, we weren't designated as an essential service, uh, but the finance industry was. And then the Association of Realtors working with, honestly, from the federal all the way down to the state and local, uh, we became an essential services, obviously with the particulars that we need to do in terms of making sure that we follow certain protocol. We have a slew of new forms that we all had to get trained on. Um, also from the brokerage level, where I'm a broker working with my wife, um, we then also implemented for all of our agents and then working also with other brokerages to make sure we have that and on the state level. We have a, a multitude of different information too, just to kind of help. So just overall, a tremendous amount of stuff has happened just for us to be able to sell real estate. And it changes, honestly, every other day. Uh, we're yeah. trying to keep in touch. Yeah, with we're those. noticing that. <laughs> right. So what will happen is so if, you, if you sell your home right now, Usually the first questions that we have is, uh, is it occupied or not occupied? So um, I just took a listing uh, yesterday okay, and uh, we're, you know, we had a conversation with the owner. I said, okay, um, we have to find out like, how comfortable are you because this is what's going to happen, even with everything we put in place. Because we, we now require what we call a disclosure entry form for coronavirus. And anyone who enters into the pro their property, we require that to be signed of that day. You mm -hmm. can't just have it because what it basically says is it says that if I'm going to show property as a buyer's agent, that the, those who are with me um, have acknowledged that they're not sick. If they do get sick, they're going to inform those who enter into the property that they have coronavirus. And then that way we kind of trace it back. So lots of additional paperwork just to make sure that when they go in there, um, if it's vacant, we make sure everything is opened. Uh, we open all the doors. We are required to wear masks. We wear gloves and we wear booties as we go into the property. Um, we actually actively disinfect afterwards. So that's that. Now, if it's occupied, uh, then you have to make sure, is the owner comfortable with that? So the most of them who are not are not in the market. So we have a few yeah. properties waiting. Uh, but those who are, you know, we go through this process. This is what we're going to have. You know, this make sure they initial it. So that, that's kind of the process with that, with listing property. So believe it or not, we are selling. And there's a big need for it because people have to move and right. go 
you know, that was a question I was going to have for you actually is what is the market like now? Is this a good time, a bad time? Are the prices up, down? What's, what's the situation? So it's, 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 it's surreal. Uh, so it also, it actually bases upon different types of levels. So what we're seeing, those who are very impacted with what's happened with coronavirus, unfortunately, those um, that have been really challenged to buy in California anyways, because a lot of those who are um, like uh, servers, self-employed, those type of things, but we're finding uh, the, the ones who usually in our price range, which our price range around, in and around, uh, around just about 30 is, is higher. And that, uh, those, that group of, of, of prospective buyers are still pretty good. I mean, we're looking at our average uh, meaning list price about 1.7, 1.5, just around just about square days overall. And those are still employed. And while we're seeing a big shift, they're keeping their jobs, they're staying at home, they're going remote. But those who cannot, um, so it's to answer your question, it's a great time because interest rates are very, very low. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you're employed, you can go there, you can get, a, you can purchase it. What's, um, it, one thing though is the market doesn't have much inventory. Uh, mm -hmm. That inventory, we're starting to see it kind of pop up a little bit because, again, those who are uncomfortable with it, especially a lot of times when you sell, you typically will have to list your house and sell it and it contingent upon its selling. So you, those, the, that group of people are usually not on the market depending upon how, they're, how they feel about what's going on. Tony, can you talk a little bit about how um, you, the use of, excuse me, technology, you know, is that now, you know, how is that changing the real estate market and, and what are you seeing there? It's justified all my technology purchases. So uh, <laughs> I, I love technology. I've, I've, my, my, I got a nickname. I've called Tech Tony in my, in my sphere, real estate agents. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I get to buy, I like to buy everything. I try to justify it to my partner, my wife, so that this is going to make us money. Just, just trust me. <laughs> uh, so I actually, three years ago, I bought a 360 camera called Theta uh, V. And it's uh, basically you take one shot. It does a full 360 picture. It's gorgeous type of stuff. But it's real, it was always very hard because everyone would have heard like the Matterport is usually the default for virtual tour. So what's changed now, you have to do a virtual tour. Uh, if your agent's not doing a virtual tour, they're a disservice to it. If you are a seller, you should request it because it's something that what's nice about it is that um, when we do a virtual tour of a property, um, we allow that well, those looky-loos to take a look and see. So we actually, before we like show them the property, we make sure, have you seen the virtual tour of mm -hmm. that property? And that kind of helps take that out. So, okay, yes, I have seen it. I do want to see it in person because honestly, until you go to a property and you have to feel it, you have to smell it sometimes, you got to kind of see everything and see if you like it. Because I've seen buyers when we take them to properties and they go in there and it just doesn't like, they don't like the way the door looks. And, it's, and you can just, and you can usually tell within the first like few seconds, say, okay, I can see you're not going to like this property because you, you just have to go there it's just and then sometimes you kind of see beyond that but um mm -hmm. virtual tours is like probably the one thing that i've seen just just right out of the gate tony are you seeing any and it may be too soon but any change in terms of just what consumers are looking for in homes now any mm -hmm. different amenities the journal had a really interesting article yesterday about you know people wanting home office space so i, I was thinking the exact same thing i mean <laughs> exactly you know it's, what's interesting is that <laughs> so facebook just announced that they're going to allow that you work remotely if you right. want and you're going yeah. to take a price reduction, which is, it's interesting. You really can't say that. I mean, it's going to be see if they were able to actually to put that, which could change a lot. So right now, a lot of people, what they're looking at is they've been stuck at home for 60 days. Yes. And you don't have an all home office or that area to actually do your work. Um, and I, I've, I have uh, my friends that I talk to. We have beer club, which used to work. We actually met twice a week. We, we bumped up to once a week because we thought it was a necessity. Yeah. And it's great. So, but all the guys there I talked to, a lot of them have their, their employed in corporate America and they're telling me it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's a hassle because I don't have a space and my wife's working over here. We have the kids, we're doing the homeschooling. So I, that has been an impact of there. I think people who are looking at properties, they're looking at if I were to work from home, because now it seems like there's going to be an option. Right. Um, do I have a space that's dedicated for that? Yep. And additionally, now you may not have to live here in California. You could live someplace else if you work remote. Mm -hmm. which I think partly is a bit of a, I told that's good and bad because when I worked in corporate America, India is a huge population of English speaking, highly educated and we already have a foot there. So we have to be kind of careful in terms of remote uh, working because I, I feel is that they're just going to go to abroad and just offset a lot of our American workers here. So you have to be careful in terms wow. of that. But 
Um, it is, it has changed a lot that we're seeing buyers looking at like the space where they're gonna be put in there for a good eight to 12 hours. And is it private enough? Do you have acoustics, lighting? Uh, I've, I can't tell me people I've talked to about getting mics, uh, lighting. I've, like right now I'm in a hotel room, so I'm trying to figure out, okay, I got the lighting over here, I have a lamp right there to kind of offset a little bit so I look okay, but my background's bad in the back, so this is what Tony, come on over to my house when you get home and I'll show you the light setup and <laughs> all the rest of it. You look great, but you see, I can see- You're welcome, welcome to check it out. Yeah. <laughs> You live and learn. Well, you know, hopefully people will stay in California and mm -hmm. at least in the United States, you know, United States in the future here. And uh, thank you so much for coming on and giving us some insight to hopefully what we can look forward to and that, you know, things aren't as bad, at least in real estate as maybe people thought. Right. Great. Every year, the American Heart Association raises money and awareness by walking in cities all over our country. Now, since we all can't formally walk together this year, I'm inviting everyone to walk in your own neighborhood. Together, let's make this the biggest walk ever, while maintaining social distancing, of course. The walk will take place June 12th through the 14th. You can walk, you can run, you can even be creative, just like Sean is. Together, we can all make a difference I'm going to make a difference. I'm making a difference. I'm making a difference. We're, We're making, making a, a difference. difference. All you have to do to participate is join our team at AmericanHeartAssociationRun.com. Eileen, you introduced our next guest to me and the community mm -hmm. when he opened his restaurant, and that was called Good Stuff. And we are welcoming Chris Bennett, who this is your 40th year in business. Chris, first of all, congratulations. That's amazing. And thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure. Now, now, Chris, you've got two restaurants and we love good stuff. Eileen and I go there for breakfast. We have meetings there. We love it. And it's just such a fun, good restaurant. The food is amazing. And I know you're ready to make the changes that you have to make since you know, the outbreak of the, the virus, but things are getting better and businesses are reopening. Yours will hopefully be reopening soon, but if you can share with us and the viewers just all the changes that you've made. I mean, you and I had a lengthy conversation and you're full of just, just great information. So let's just start in the restaurant. Tell us what is going to be different. Well, we have put in place um, a multitude of uh, changes in our restaurants now that we are only takeout and uh, including curbside and delivery as well. But we are sanitizing everything um, uh, uh, pretty much on a, like let's say for instance, a customer comes in and they pay for their meal with a credit card. Right. We have sanitized pens, we have hand sanitizer at the desk, I mean, at the counter, we have uh, we have um, the credit card that is given to us is wiped down with the sanitizer as well before it's given back to the customer. When the food is packaged, we package everything up in 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 to go proper to to go containers with wrapped silverware that's been put together by people that have just washed their hands. All the deliveries are stapled shut, so the delivery person has no opportunity to get into that bag or do anything. It's stapled shut, and the customers are very aware of that now that we've been doing it. Um, we also are uh, washing our hands on a regular basis. We're wearing masks. We are keeping the doors open so that doesn't so that people do not have to, customers do not have to ha handle any hardware to come in. Um, we are, uh, we are making sure that all our employees that come to work are not sick or not feeling, if they have any of the slightest feeling of not feeling well, um, we send them home and have them rest and, and get better. We are very, all our employees are very up to speed on what the sanitation and what how important it is. Mm -hmm. I've heard things like we'll have be able to open up at 25% occupancy, but I've also heard we can open up as long as we keep spacing at six feet between customers, not between the tables, but between customers. But we are we're ramping up and in, in in we are in 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 touch with our employees that are that are on furlough to make sure that they're ready and they understand what it's going to take to come back to work. Right. And um, 
we have a decision to make on single use um, menus. So when we do get reopened, we'll have single use menus or we'll, be, we'll have to sanitize our regular menus at each, every, every time that the customer touches it, comes back to our counter, we'll have to say, we'll sanitize it. Mm -hmm. um, we also are, they're trying to encourage everybody to use plastic wear. Now, yeah. my feeling on plastic wear is that, you know, we've already, we've gone round and round on this single use products that are just going in the trash. So my feeling is that we are gonna set up a station and we'll wrap our silverware. So we'll have somebody wrapping it with clean hands, sanitized mask. We'll do a big bunch of silverware and that'll be used to take to the table. We'll set it down, we'll have a napkin wrapped with silverware inside that has been you know, cleaned, sanitized. Our dishwashers are all sanitized. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the way to go. I'd rather not use single use and end up throwing it in the trash, honestly, because yeah. someone's going to touch the silverware no matter what. We just need to make sure that our hands are clean yes. and have masks on when we do it. And, right. and not only that, but when I go into a restaurant, I, I want silverware. I don't want to cut a yeah. steak or a hamburger or anything with a plastic knife. Um, I mean, that's just me. Right. You know, there'll be people that will have other ideas, but mm -hmm. I like the fact that you're wrapping them and making it clean. I will tell you for the menus, I would love to take menu home because that way mm -hmm. I put it in my purse and mm -hmm. I'm thinking, oh, you know what? I could do takeout in a couple of days and I have the menu right there. So mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of like that idea actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the yeah. single, I mean, we have to go menus, which are readily available sure. um, with, at the, at the counter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, talk to us a little bit about um, the chamber's been working with our cities to, um, uh, as we get the go ahead to reopen, to kind of expand um, square footage outside for more outdoor dining. Um, tell us how you would, you know, how that would work for you and, and what you think about that. I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. I, I think we just have to be responsible for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're going to take care of our responsibility yeah. at the restaurant. We're going to be by the book, the law, the book, the book of the, you know, yep. whatever the rules are. Tom and we are going to make sure that we keep everything as sanitized as possible. Everyone's wearing masks, washing mm -hmm. hands on a regular basis. Chris, tell us about the family meals that yes. you have been doing. Oh, oh yes. so good. So good. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is one thing that has come out of the pandemic that has been such a plus for us. Mm -hmm. And I am going to continue these even Good. after we open. We're going to have a family takeout meal because it's, it's such a, a no-brainer. So we, we, what we do is this week we have a Dijon turkey meatloaf with uh, red bell peppers, onions, and mushrooms in the, in the, and Dijon mustard in the meatloaf. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely delicious white turkey meat mashed potatoes and gravy, mm -hmm. a green salad, dinner rolls, and an apple cobbler with a la mode. I'm hungry now, cream. thank you very much. <laughs> Six people <laughs> for $60. Now, tell me that doesn't scream comfort food. That's amazing. Come on, that's as comfort food as you get, right? <laughs> yes. And so we're gonna continue this. Chris, tell us a little bit about, I mean, obviously um, you have amazing food and it's so good and it's healthy and it's amazing. And, and that's obviously been a great part along with your customer service of your success in building your business over the last 40 years. But you've also earned a very well-deserved reputation for being involved and participating in the community and supporting the community and the nonprofit. So tell us a little bit about some of the things you've been doing in that regard um, with the first responders and, and, and some of those, you've got a number of different programs. Um, sure, well, yeah. let, me, let me back up and talk to you about this. Uh, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. I got into this crazy business. I was 27 years old. And um, right out of college, I went to uh, hospitality school in, at the University of Denver, got a business degree in the hotel restaurant management school. Mm -hmm. I got out of school and, you know, I worked for somebody and I saw this, this blatant disregard for their employees, their customers. They were all about making money that day and not looking at the future. And, and I decided that, you know, when I get my restaurant, I'm going to look at it more long term. I'm going to take the Ray Kroc from McDonald's attitude that mm -hmm. keeping your restaurant current, keeping it clean, keeping it painted, and being ingrained in the community. So that has served me very well as I've, I have restaurants that have been around for 40 years, one for 22, 
one for 16, you know, and up here in PB for five, which is a feat in itself. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yes. Yes. You know what I mean? So um, it's, it's important for us to, to, to give back. So I was sitting around on this, this pandemic kind of feeling sorry for myself and the restaurants and my employees and my daughter says, yeah, you gotta do, you gotta do something. You got you, you gotta do something. You gotta, you should be serving and helping feed the first responders that are putting their lives on the line. So I was like, that's brilliant. And the next week I heard from three customers saying the same thing, Chris, you've got such a great, you know, inroad to your customers with your emails. You should be doing, you should do this. So I thought, you know, let's, let's give it a shot. So approached the hospitals. Um, the hospitals were more than happy to, to, to accept food for us, from us. We went through a couple of the, you know, certified, we had to show them our latest uh, health department tests that, you know, I mean, uh, uh, great and make sure that we're a commercial kitchen and we started up. So I, 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 put something out to my email list of, I got like 50,000 email lists. So it's pretty big wow. over the years. <laughs> and we got, uh, we sold 300 meals the first day, oh, 300 meals. The next day we sold another 200 meals and we didn't even have a system in place of how we were going to do this, but we just rock and rolled on Friday the next day. And we started our first delivery over the next three weeks. We raised uh, over 2,500 meals and delivered them to first responders at Torrance Memorial, little company of Mary. We expanded to some urgent care centers that were, were testing for COVID. We also uh, took care of our, our local police department, fire departments, and our LA County lifeguards in that period of time, serving 2,500 meals in about four weeks we did it. Dean and I will be right there mm -hmm. having lunch, breakfast, whatever, <laughs> as soon as the doors are yeah. open. Chris, thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. on today and just you know, informing us about you know, mm -hmm. all the changes so that people feel safe and they can sit down and have a delicious meal of good mm -hmm. stuff. And, and by the grace of God, I've been given these opportunities to be able to do this in the community. And I'm blessed by that. Trust, truly blessed. Well, and we all blessed for knowing you. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Chris, we'll have you on again. In fact, we can't wait to have, bring the cameras in the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. let's do that. The doors <laughs> open, we'll do it. We'll do a little social distancing and yes. maybe sneak our masks down to see our smiles. But yeah, I love it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Chris. Chris Bennett from Good Stuff. And Eileen and I will be right back. Thanks again, Chris. Eileen, such a great show today. And I want to remind all of our local businesses, please let us know when you are and how you are reopening your doors. And come and be a guest on the show with us and let the community know so they feel safe. Absolutely. Our businesses are smart. The people who own our businesses are smart. They know what the protocols are in terms of physical distancing and sanitation and limited capacity and all of that. And they're very anxious to um, uh, protect their workers, protect the customers, and they're anxious to get back to business and reopen and um, continue to support the community. That's right. And speaking of supporting the community, I have to just pass along a compliment to you. You know, I love you. Even <laughs> our mayor, John Cruikshank, said to me the other day that every chamber of commerce should be modeled after what you do, Eileen. The community is so incredibly lucky to have you, as mm -hmm. are we. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everything that you do. We really could not be doing this without you. Thank you. Well, we appreciate everything that our partnership with the city and everything that you do to support our residents and um, our businesses. So thank you, Maria. Thank you as well. All right. And thank you for watching. I'm Maria Soreo for Eileen Hupp, and we'll see you next time around the peninsula.